Hey, Dave. 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 Dave, you're my helper up here. second. Good morning. Uh, the spiritual people must be up in the balcony and down here or something. Or the spiritual people are here, right? Um, but uh, good morning. Uh, great to have you here. And as we begin, we want to uh, touch on some of the announcements. Uh, of course, following this morning service, we are going to have uh, Sunday school. And so young people will meet back in that room. Adults, Dave is going to finish up on the... Uh, heaven, I believe, and then we'll be starting a new study. And uh, I, he'll be gone for a couple of weeks, so I'll start that out. It'll be uh, some uh, uh, DVD, and just like the, the, the series on, with Randy Elkhorn in Heaven, uh, this is by, I'm trying to remember what his name is, um, the author. I'll get, it'll come around about 15 minutes from now. In the middle of a sermon, I'll blurt it out or something. Um, but uh, it, we actually did that in, in men's Bible study. I thought it was really a good study. Um, also, uh, lighting the Advent candle today will be uh, uh, Garrett Mills, and so he'll be doing that, lighting our first Advent candle. Uh, we have, uh, besides Sunday school, after that we have our first light radio broadcast at 1130. Wednesday we have our Bible study and prayer time. Hope that you will show up for that. Saturday, um, men's Bible study. There won't be any Bible study this Saturday for women, but uh, I believe the next one, right? <clears throat> any other announcements that need to be made? Uh, December 6th will be our, our board, next church board meeting, and uh, we're glad you're here. As we uh, go to prayer, we do have a number of people sick, and I know we have some other people that are traveling or will be traveling today. And so we want to be praying for them. I know uh, uh, Brenda and Millie uh, are, are sick, and Millie's daughter, Sharon, we want to be praying for them. They're uh, quite sick. And uh, I guess Brenda's doing better today, right? And uh, Mil Millie is a little bit as well, too. So let's go ahead and, and uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Fathers, we come before you. We Thank you so much for your grace, which is sufficient. We thank you for your peace that passes all understanding. We thank you for your love that endures forever. And Lord, we have much to be thankful for. And we do hold up uh, those in our congregation that are uh, sick. And Lord, that they are on the road to recovery. We pray for your quick healing. We pray for uh, those that are traveling and We'll be traveling back today or in the next days, and we pray that your hand would be upon them. We pray that you would be magnified and glorified in each of our lives, Lord, and that we might recognize you whether we're uh, in sickness. Sometimes that's when we realize how desperate we are for you or when things are going smooth that we would praise you in all of those circumstances. I know it's easier said than done, but... Lord, we thank you that you do do a deep work in us many times that cause us to praise you and, and when it wouldn't make sense. 
And Father, we pray for uh, our country and our leaders. We pray for uh, the, those that in other countries, Lord, that don't have medical help and are struggling. And, and Lord, those have suffered loss. And, and we think of all the things that are going on in our country. We need you, Lord. We need to turn back to you. Uh, there's no human leader that can do it. You can, Lord. And so we look to you. We pray for our nation. We pray for our state. We pray for our county. We pray for our communities here. And so, Father, as we come, we commit these things to you. We know that you are in control. You are still on the throne. No one has pried you off of it. You're not wringing your hands in heaven, Lord, that you are working out your plans just the way you want them. And we don't understand that, but we do know that you are in control. You are sovereign. And so we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. At this time, I'm going to have everybody stand, if you can, for the lighting of the uh, Advent candle. Good to see Brett back with us there from the land of the, he's in the land of the living. He was, yeah. It's taking longer to run the two sticks together, I think, right there. Maybe we'll get a, we have one up here, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is working a little different than we thought. We tried it out before and, okay, thank you, Harlan. Good job, thank you, Garrett. Glad to help me, help me helping up front, uh, Elder uh, Dave Behrens. We have uh, Jay Understead, and we have Larry Dostal. Uh, Jay's on the music. We have the on the the camera, and uh, Larry's on the sound. We have the Grace Bible Band, part of them here. So we're going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to Dave. Okay, well, good morning. Um, are we going to do our song next? Is that correct? Yep, yep, okay. now the song. All right, so you can remain standing for our first song.
is to the sky. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. I like that one phrase in the song, in the shadow, in your shadows I find strength. Just in your shadow we will find strength. It's really neat. Well, we're going to have our responsive reading here. You can find it in the hymnal, number 246. <clears throat> <clears throat> Prince of Peace. <clears throat> and it's basically, it's based on Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a, sa a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Wonderful Counselor, Counselor, Mighty God, God Everlasting God. Father, Prince of, of Peace. <clears throat> you may be seated for our next hymn, number 270. join together in a word of prayer before the message. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for so many, many things. We thank you for the opportunity to gather so freely as we're doing at this very moment. We ask, Lord, that you would bless the, uh, all the long hours and uh, time and effort that Pastor Thomas put into this message. We pray that you would speak to us through him as you speak to him. And uh, help us, Lord, to receive your word and that our hearts and lives would be changed by it and that we'd all be moved closer to you. In Jesus' life-giving name, amen. Thank you, Dave. want to uh, say hi to those that are watching online. Tammy Sherman, uh, Ron and Kathy Blinsky said they're living the dream in South Dakota. Uh, Al Allison Nemec, uh, Shirley Nemec. Janet Peterson, trust your 
uh, recovering Janet, she's been sick. Um, Jean Allstrike, Tim Hauer, let us know that you're watching. That's always an encouragement. I know we have some others on as well. If you open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, and we have the announcement of the preparer. And as we turn to the Gospel of Luke, Luke and the book of Acts are written by the same author, Dr. Luke. And in fact, one of the keys to realizing uh, who wrote both books is, are the first four verses and the Gospel of Luke and the first few verses and the book of Acts. And he's writing to the same person. We don't know who the person is. Uh, probably a, an important uh, Roman official, maybe a convert of Luke. But Luke uh, does some research and it uh, gives us some insight also into how the, the Bible was put together by the Holy Spirit, directing to certain portions of Scripture, certain witnesses. Now, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have much of the same material, and yet written for a different purpose. So the Gospel of Luke is really, uh, and I think it makes sense because Luke was a physician, it focuses upon his humanity. When you th read through the, the Gospel of Luke, you see an emphasis upon the humanity of Christ. He was God, but he was man. And uh, here in Luke 1, 1 to 4, I just want to read the recipient here of this letter. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So here he obviously interviewed eyewitnesses. Have you ever thought, well, how would anybody know what, what Mary was experiencing? Probably talked to Mary and got her uh, insight on it. And we know that she was alive when Jesus died and rose again. And so she had seen his life and, and little segments of his life, of course, the disciples. But here's the recipient. And then we see this impossible situation. Have you ever had an impossible situation? I think we all have at some point. And we don't know how it's going to work out. We don't know. If we knew it was going to work out, we could relax, couldn't we? We say it's all going to work out. Well, it normally does. But uh, here was this impossible situation of wanting to have a baby and not able to have a baby. Uh, look at uh, verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. So here it was not a sin problem, some major sin problem that prevented them from having babies. Some people are not intended to have babies for whatever reason. Maybe it's so that they may adopt, so, or, or they have an influence in other areas. I've known teachers that have had a profound influence. I think if they had their own kids, they wouldn't have had a, such a profound influence upon young people that they need to be helped. But here was a desire, and uh, they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they're both very old. Two strikes against them, right? Very old, not able to conceive. And the Bible says you're not able to conceive. conceive you're not able to conceive. If the Bible says you're very old, you're very old. And uh, advanced age, though, does not prevent God from answering our prayers, regardless of the kind of request. In this instant, the request had to do with reproduction. And they said not everyone is called to have kids. In fact, Paul urged um, people not to marry if they could, if they could abstain so that they could serve the Lord full with their full devotion. But he said not everybody has that gift. It can end up being, getting a person in trouble. 
having resigned themselves that God would not answer their specific prayer, did not necessarily prevent God from answering their prayer. They evidently at some point gave up, as we'll see, but God stepped in. They had prayed, but the answer had not come. Why had it not come? I think it's because God wanted to demonstrate his power and the timing and that uh, that's what he was focused upon. God had a plan. God had a plan. We see the incense being offered. Now look at verse 8. So here we're told where God in, in his divine providence sets things up. So Zechariah is chosen at this particular time and this great announcement is going to be made to him. We see the incense being offered. Look at verses 8 to 10. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by Lot. You know, so they sometimes what they considered a lot was they'd have stones and you pull out a certain stone or straws or whatever, some way of determining. And it just happened that he was chosen. I don't think it just happened. You think of when Jonah fled from the presence of the Lord and they cast lots to see whose who's reason for all this problem was. The lot fell upon Jonah. God was in control of those little details. He controlled the storm. He controlled usually stones that were put in a bag or something. And, uh, but here he's in the temple. He was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Now, this is not something that just happened all the time. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So when you look at the Bible and you see incense, it's used around the globe, really, uh, but, and had been by the Egyptians and all kinds of cultures, usually represents prayers. In fact, uh, in Psalm 141.2, I call to you, Lord, come quickly to me. Hear me when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. In Revelation 5, 8, we're told, And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. So incense represents the prayers of God's people. So they're offering incense, and then people are praying. So they're outside praying, and here is Zechariah alone, offering incense, and then something dramatic happens. Look at uh, verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. You know, generally this is what takes place when a person meets an angel, when they reveal themselves to a person. And... Uh, the fact is, God has a way of, of, of uh, surprising us, uh, stepping in. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Now listen to this. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Now, here is a dramatic intervention an impossible situation, this angel, of this incense being offered at this particular time, this particular revelation is being given to him by an angel. You know, the Bible says many have entertained angels without even realizing it, and maybe we have, but when they reveal themselves, often they fall. They fall down at the feet of the person, at the angel, as, you know, just can't handle it, even godly people. And, uh, but here, he's told not only that his wife, who's barren, who's old, is going to have a kid, but not just a child, a boy, and what his name is going to be. And uh, he will be a joy, verse 14, he will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his, of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord he is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. 
He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Think about Elijah. Remember Mount Carmel? And the people were so uh, idolatrous, and he has the showdown at, at Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal, and uh, he ends up having all of them killed, and the people turn and say, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God, and God sends rain, and, but ultimately, he, Elijah was turning people back. He said, this is what John the Baptist is going to be like. And you think about this, John the Baptist, Jesus referred to him as the greatest man born of women. So was Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayer answered? You better believe it. The greatest man born of women. Now, Jesus was God in the flesh. And he would, but, but uh, John the Baptist would be uh, pronouncing uh, and, and, and talking to, about him. He would be great in the sight of the Lord. He had never to take wine or other fermented drink. And he would be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he was born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You know, it's hard to wait, isn't it? And Charles Spurgeon said this, if the Lord Jehovah makes us wait, Charles Spurgeon was a great preacher of the 1800s. If the Lord Jehovah makes us wait, let us do so with our whole hearts for blessed are all they that wait for him. He is worth waiting for. The waiting itself is beneficial to us. It tries faith, it exercises patience. It trains submission and endears uh, the blessing when it comes. The Lord's people have always been a waiting people. You find it easy to wait? I don't find it easy to wait. How about you're sitting at a green light behind somebody who's, who's uh, looking at their phone or digging around in their purse or whatever it is, picked on a woman there, but, um, you know, and then you, so then you maybe barely make it through that light and then you don't make it through the next light and you happen to be in a hurry. Anybody get frustrated with that? Now that's, that's such long waiting, isn't it? But you think about waiting for years, waiting for years. And here is this uh, uh, announcement by this angel. And it's incredible. We see, uh, first of all, there's different ways of making announcements, you know. There can be announcements in papers, announcements on the radio, announcements on, the, on Facebook, on the Internet. Uh, you can fly a plane in the sky with an announcement on the back of it. Uh, there's all kinds of ways. You can send out invitations and letters. And uh, Well, here uh, you see this announcement came by the appearance of the angel. He appeared while people were praying. You know, and we have other evidence where Jesus, Jesus uh, prayed and the angel appeared with him. Cornelius in Acts 10 uh, received revelation as he prayed from an angel. Acts 11, Peter received revelation from an angel as he, people prayed. Acts 12, Peter was set free from prison while the church prayed. And things not only happen as a result of prayer, but also while we pray and even before we pray. He, first of all, he appeared while people were praying, and he appeared to a person who had been praying. And he says, your prayer has been heard. What an encouragement. Your prayer has been heard. And uh, that should have been enough right there with an angel. You know, here he is. Nobody else is in there, and here's an angel talking to him. He's terrified at first. So he recognizes this is something special. But, the, but as we'll see, he, he didn't accept it. And uh, it was unbelief, insane unbelief, really. And we can exercise that. Well, first of all, we see the appearance of the angel. We see the effect of the angel. His religious position before God. Uh, here was Zechariah, a priest. He should have recognized something was going on. He would have known about Abraham. Oh, Abraham and Sarah had this baby later in life. He had this righteous standing with God, and yet we'll see that he it met with the, this announcement met with unbelief. The announcement of the angel showed insight into Zechariah's life. He knew he knew they'd been praying. He knew his wife's name. 
showed insights into God's uh, promise to his people that this was going to be fulfillment of a promise that God had been making down through the century. You know, I think of Isaiah 40, where he says, prepare a way in the wilderness, make a way straight for him. And so here, uh, John the Baptist was preparing a way. And uh, here we have the, he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. We see the affront to the angel. So here is this angel, comes during a time of prayer, comes during incense being offered. Zechariah is a priest. He's given this insight that God knows his wife's name. He knows he's been praying for a baby. And there's nobody else in there. There could be nobody else in there. And yet he does not believe the affront to the angel. The situation he was in should have spawned belief. The place he was in, the position he was in as, as a priest at this particular time offering the incense. And then we see the scriptural record should have uh, been believed on and not spurred, uh, spurred him away from belief, but spurred him on to belief. Because here was a, a whole record of people that, uh, like Abraham, their whole people, their whole, their whole nation traced back to Abraham waiting for that child of promise. And now he's given a promise, not to the same degree, but uh, even just as wonderful, the greatest man born among women. And then the assurance of the angel was given. Uh, there was no doubt what Zechariah wanted. He wanted to have a baby and he wanted a, an assurance, but he didn't need to have that assurance. He didn't need to have a sign. What more could you ask for? An angel is talking to you. What more can you ask for? And yet he says, uh, what will be the sign? Look at the incredible unbelief exhibited. Look at verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. So here he says, he pulls up the objections, right? And they are valid objections prior to the angel appearing to him. But they were no longer valid because here was an angel talking to him. He says, how can I be sure of this? This angel, Gabriel, who stands before God in the presence of God is speaking to him. What more of a sign do you need? How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news, how fr frustrating it was for this angel. Here this guy had been praying. The answer is coming. It should have been, wow, praise the Lord. But instead he says, how do I know that this is going to actually happen? It's unbelief, absolute unbelief. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. What was it? It was unbelief, absolute unbelief, by a man who'd been praying. I wonder if he believed his prayers were going to answer it. I think probably at some time when it did, but as time went on, as he got old, as the answer didn't come, as uh, his wife was barren, it looks pretty hopeless. And yet here, they're given this incredible promise, and it's met with incredible unbelief. Unbelief in our lives is a serious sin and sin always has consequences. So what was the sign he got? He's not gonna be able to talk till that baby's born. Well, we got at least nine months that that baby, he's not gonna talk. Wouldn't that be a, a kind of a bummer? And uh, you know, I guess at this point, it, it looks pretty hopeless. And he can't talk. In fact, it starts right away when it goes out. So we need to realize how serious the sin of unbelief is, and it always has consequences. And God's answer to a person's prayers can seem too good to be true. You know, maybe God is on the verge of answering a prayer request for you, and it just seems too good to be true. I think we hope for that. We look for that. We long for that. Because all things are possible with him. And we may get beat down, and we get back up. 
that's working through our faith and we want to make sure that we're praying for something within God's will. We need to remember that delays to answer prayers are not always denials. Delays to answer prayers are not always denials. Have you prayed for something for a long time? A long time? Uh, my friend Rocky, he's passed away this uh, spring and uh, we were very uh, we'd get in trouble all the time, and then I came to know the Lord, and he went on with his lifestyle. And um, really, uh, I witnessed to him and many times, and I prayed for him. There were two people that God put on my heart outside of family members to pray for, just to keep praying. And Rocky, uh, after about, oh, probably 28 years or so, finally called me up and said, Rake, that's what he called me. He said, I want to ask Christ to come into my life, and you're the only one I'm gonna, I want to do it with. So we, I led him to the Lord on the phone, did everything, his life, there was something changed there, and I'm grateful for that, and he's with the Lord. I'll get to see him again. But boy, I thought, all those years, I'm going to keep persevering. You know, George Mueller was a great man of prayer, and I think that's what kind of inspired for me. There were three friends, one of them he prayed for like 25 years, one of them like 40 years, and one of them came to know the Lord after he had died. It was over 50 years he had died. He had prayed for him. It's worth it. If a person is headed towards hell, shouldn't we do everything we can to try and bring them to Christ, to try to turn them so they can be in heaven? That's what God wants, isn't it? That's what he wants. And uh, delays to answer prayer may be a means of revealing to others that God is doing something special. You know, other people are watching as you're praying. We have some requests as a family. We keep praying. I believe those requests will come. I don't see, they, see them anywhere in sight now, but I do believe that. And yet, uh, we have those times of doubts. All of us do. The timing of God's answers to prayer are perfect. Think of how he arranged all of this. Here, Zechariah and Elizabeth, he put in them a desire to have children, but they were unable to have a child. They grew old. Uh, here, here she is, his barren. And uh, ultimately, God puts him in that position at that particular time, and it was all important because the Christ was going to be coming in about Six months after that, remember how Mary goes and uh, John the Baptist leaps in her womb. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And all of this was part of, the, part of God's great plan. Sometimes God waits with his answer to our prayers as a means of showing us how, uh, us and others, how great his power is. And some of the greatest and most desired, important answers to prayer may come when a person is old. Some of the greatest and most wonderful answers to prayer may come when a person is old. And uh, so here we have, uh, have uh, this waiting. John Ortberg, a, a famous preacher, he says, biblically waiting is not just something we have to do until we get what we want. Waiting is part of the process of becoming what God wants us to, do, to be. Then we see finally this impossible prayer answered. This impossible prayer answered. Look at verse 21. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. What's taking that boy in there so long? And uh, should have maybe been a short amount of time in there, but this angel was speaking to him. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. <clears throat> the Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. So here, God, what had seemed like a disgrace to them, they were righteous, but still, what was the deal? 
the their prayers were not answered. They were not, and in that culture, in that society, you and that's sometimes today, people say, well, that's why there must be sin or whatever. But he said, God has taken my disgrace away. Prayers that have been made, sometimes with great passion, can be and sometimes are answered in a seemingly untimely and unlikely fashion. The answer came when both Zechariah and Sarah Elizabeth were advanced in years, but this was God it's ordained wonderful plan and uh, don't let your age prevent you from praying don't let your age prevent you from asking God for great things the Lord's personal revelation to us will involve and ultimately affect others as well if he calls us to do something or answers a prayer those around us will be affected the fact is the uh, revelation would not only affect Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth but the nation would be influenced all history would be influenced by John the Baptist. And it's possible for a person to know that they have received an answer to prayer before there is physical proof of the answer. Um, she uh, evidently received the answer, but uh, here Zechariah, despite being given all of this incredible revelation in, in the temple, he just did not believe it. The very person, a priest who should, should have, just could not believe it until he basically was going to wait nine months before he could speak, at least nine months. The answer to some requests may arrive after many years have passed. Indeed, there are times when it seems as though our requests are not going to be answered. Do you ever feel like that? Maybe your request is not going to be answered. You keep pressing on. I think of, of the widow woman and Jesus told this parable that men ought always to pray and not give up and about this widow woman who had this unjust judge and she could not be vindicated and she kept going to him and finally the judge says, don't, don't fear God or care about people. I'm gonna give her a request so she doesn't come. Well, God is not like that judge, but we are to keep coming to heaven, coming to him. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Keep praying, keep asking. Some blessings and answers to prayers are preserved and reserved for our latter years. We're told here in verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. Well, God had an answer, didn't he? Why does God sometimes answer requests later? First of all, the answer is more profoundly appreciated and also the answer is more visibly miraculous. Delays serve to show that God is the one who answered. You know, maybe today there's something that you have on your heart that you have just kept praying, you keep praying. You say, I don't think it can ever happen. I don't think anything can ever change. Uh, that's a lie, isn't it? And God is unlimited in his ways. He can use an angel. He can use another person. He can use a circumstance, a situation, a negative, positive, whatever it may be, to answer that prayer. And so today... Um, let's learn from Zechariah. Let's exercise faith. When we see the promises of God, ask and you shall receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened unto you. Let's accept it as it is. Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart, the longings of your heart. And he knows what those desires are. He knows how to fulfill you, your deepest needs, your deepest longings. And it may seem impossible, but God is, is all-knowing and all-caring and all-powerful. And all things are possible with him. Amen? Amen. We're going to have our last song now.
From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so Amen. Let's give him a hand. The front of our bulletin says, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, Colossians 4, 2. And so we are to continue and we're to watch for those answers when they come. And uh, sometimes they can surprise us and they may be happening and we don't even realize it. So let's just keep praying and looking and trusting and, and steer away from the the sin of unbelief. Hebrews 11:6. 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For the one who comes to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So let's exercise faith. May God help me, Pastor Tom. May God help you to do that. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this time. And we just uh, ask for your blessing upon uh, each one here and upon the Sunday school time, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen.